look at the beauty of it. It's just uh, an absolute uh, marvel of engineering. It's uh, truly lovely. Some people think this is a hobby. I'd call it more of an obsession. It certainly is a gamble. It has its moments. We often find ourselves buying pieces of old audio equipment which drive us insane with problems. But every now and again, we hit what we feel is the jackpot. And that might be a slight overstatement here, but uh, I certainly believe I've gone and scored a right bargain and uh, a right beauty. Just take a look at this lovely piece of equipment. I really love the uh, audio equipment from this era. It stems from a golden age of Japanese audio equipment. And uh, I love the chunky design and the brushed aluminium and this, that and the other. I could drool all over it uh, all night long, but uh, let's get some basic info on the video. And uh, dimensions first, 43 centimeters across just over 14 centimetres high, including the feet. The depth is about 23 centimetres, give or take a bit. Obviously you've got uh, buttons, switches, etc. protruding, but uh, the main body that is. So it's very solid. And uh, as you'd expect from this era, everything is well built it's uh, very high quality now i had a look on the internet of course i did some research on it and when i put in the uh, technics m22g information it was prefixed with the letters rs and a hyphen so i'm not sure why that is but the audio heritage website clearly lists it as an rs M22G and yet the picture on the website doesn't show the RS in the model name it's the identical one to this so I'm not sure what that's all about I'm finding it increasingly more difficult to get good information from the internet these days it's uh, got an SX head that's what that says there had a look into the info and it says it's got a send dust head. Send dust is supposedly better than permalloy. And uh, I will put up a screenshot now so you can see the Wikipedia page about send dust. I bought this in Hard Off, which is part of the Book Off company. And uh, Hard Off is uh, a chain of shops all over Japan that sells used stuff, uh, sometimes called recycled shops, reused shops. And uh, the great thing is it came with a three month warranty. This is something that is absolutely peace of mind, especially when you're buying something as old as this. This tape deck is from 1979 quite amazing to find an old cassette deck from 1979 in this condition it has been cleaned up i guess the hard off staff have cleaned it up to sell it it was wrapped in cellophane when i bought it and uh, as i said has a three month warranty so therefore you can buy with confidence and they Generally speaking, they won't quibble. You, uh, If you take it back and you show them what the fault is, they will take the item back and refund you. And uh, this particular deck was really a bargain. I, uh, I snapped it up. I was suspicious as to whether it even works properly given the low price I paid for it. I paid about 5,000 yen. So uh, at today's prices, that's probably about what? Uh, maybe about 30 British pounds and uh, 40 US dollars, something like that. Considering what you get these days and some of the prices that some of the decks are going for, it is quite the bargain. And uh, 
I'm pleased to say I've played a few cassettes on it this afternoon after setting it up and it works almost perfectly. Give or take, you have to allow a little bit for its age, of course, and I'll uh, tell you later the uh, one problem that I've discovered so far, which is not a major issue in my opinion, but I'll explain more about it later. So one good thing about buying an old piece of uh, audio equipment from this era is it doesn't have too many complicated internals. According to the Audio Heritage website, this deck is all about simplicity and just simply doing the basic functions well. This is a screenshot from Google Translate from the Audio Heritage website information. And I think that's what they've achieved here. And uh, frankly, that's what we like, especially when you're looking at old equipment, because I've got some very complicated high-end decks in my collection, which never quite work well. They always have the odd niggle here and there. They always have some kind of issue that is most frustrating. A deck like this is indeed very simple and there's very little to go wrong with it. Now, maybe you can help me on this because I've had a look on the uh, internet, as I said, and what I can't seem to figure out is, I'm assuming this is not a direct drive motor because it doesn't say anything on it about being direct drive. And uh, the only way, of course, to find out is to take the cover off and have a look inside. The buttons here, they're all uh, piano key. There are no solenoids here, no complicated uh, electronics such as logic control. And uh, which, you know, they were great features when they were introduced back in the day, but they don't half cause problems when they go wrong. And uh, you'll see that on some of the later cassette decks that I've got on this channel with dodgy logic control, dodgy electronics. So everything, as I said, is very solid. It feels great, this brushed aluminium. The uh, shop staff have cleaned it up very well indeed. And I'll show you some close-ups of the other surfaces shortly. And uh, point to note this timer function here. This is usually something that works in conjunction with another device, an external device that is made by all the uh, manufacturers. So Technics used to make timer devices and so did all the other major manufacturers in Japan. And uh, this, as far as I'm aware, is only something that works in conjunction with an external timer device. So it won't work with the deck as it is. It's not something that concerns me. It's not something I'll ever use, but it's just a point to note. And uh, another point to note is that the uh, headphone socket there, the full size headphone jack there, by the way, and one thing to note, maybe in case you hadn't noticed, there is no level control for the headphones. So you're stuck with what the Technics designers considered an optimum volume for your headphones. There's no way to control that whatsoever. Slightly odd. And uh, I've been listening via headphones today and uh, haven't rigged it up to an amp or speakers yet. I've just been using it for the purpose of testing it because it's under the three month warranty. So I need to know whether everything works all right in case I, I want to take it back. And uh, one thing I will say is that I'm really impressed. I cannot detect any wow and flutter. Now that was something I was truly expecting because I've got, to, as I said, I've got other decks and I've got an old deck from the 70s, an old uh, Victor, that's JVC deck from the 70s. And that does have wow and flutter. Now I know sometimes a wow and flutter can be cured with new belts, I'm aware of that. But this deck has no wow and flutter whatsoever. As I said, I'm not sure whether that is because it's 
direct drive, but even direct drive, sometimes the motors go and cause wear and flutter. Other aspects, other factors can cause wear and flutter, such as, uh, you know, misshapen uh, pinch rollers and things like that. I had a bit of a sniff inside when I opened it. If you look at the uh, soft eject there, by the way, nice. And uh, I had a bit of a sniff inside there and it does smell very well lubed. So uh, I'm assuming that somebody's had a poke around inside and uh, lubed it well. Oh, you are awful, but I like you. So uh, that's a result. Other points to note, so uh, Dolby, you don't have any Dolby options. This is typical back in the day. So remember this is a 1979 deck. You just have the option of Dolby in and out. That will be Dolby B by the way. And uh, just remember when a deck has Dolby but it doesn't tell you which version of Dolby it is, it's generally Dolby B and it would be from this era anyway. Your line selector there, so uh, you've probably noticed you've got um, left and right uh, channel microphone input uh, sockets there and you can select between line and mic so that's for your recording and uh, very typical back in the day to have uh, microphone inputs for recording very typical indeed now this is interesting you've got your tape select mode you've got the option for four cassette tape types, four tape types there. Now, it doesn't list them by number. It simply says NOR for normal, so that's type one. The uh, ferrochrome, that's type three, by the way. Very rare indeed. Back in the day, it wasn't so rare from this era. It was pretty typical to have type three ferrochrome bias options on your decks. And... Uh, Type 2, that's the Chrome, CRO2, that's Chrome. And then you've got this interesting one here. You've got this additional button to uh, select for metal. So you need to select it to Type 2 Chrome, and then you just select metal out. So if, when it's on out, that means it's on Type 2. And when you put that button up, as you can see there, it says metal and... Uh, you've got your type 4 bias settings and uh, the uh, tape counter very typical uh, three digit uh, analog tape counter nicely beveled switch very nice feels like everything feels nice by the way everything feels pretty typically uh, high quality so there we are we've got it switched on and uh, I love the fluorescent meter nice and simple it's uh, although it's a, just a simple white color it's very clear indeed this fluorescent meter these VU meters have not deteriorated whatsoever they are still as bright as I suspect the day they were born they uh, really are a marvel and uh, we do love VU meters don't we so if I press play, you can get an idea of what that looks like. And you won't hear anything because I haven't got it uh, connected to the speakers. But I'll just press play so you can see the fluorescent meters, the VU meters in action. There we are. Really silent mechanism. I can't hear a thing, by the way. It's very quiet indeed. It's very smooth. Yeah, it's a TD, TDK D60. That's what I'm playing from the 90s. Will you look at those uh, VU meters? Absolutely beautiful. I can't get over how crisp that display is. Really lovely. There we are. So I've tested everything. All the buttons work fine. Everything's absolutely fine. Uh, there's no fancy music search or anything like that. You wouldn't expect it. Uh, although things like that may have existed back then, I I'm not really sure uh, what was available in 1979 but uh, suffice it to say this as the audio heritage site says it does the simple function of a cassette deck very well looking at the top it's uh, been given a good rub you can probably see 
rub marks where the shop staff cleaned it up. There's a, a scratch there, some sort of mark there, and a small one there, something small at the back there, and a bit of a scratch here. But, uh, I mean, nothing serious given the age. It's, uh, you know, for a 1970s model, I think it's in good condition. You can see the door for the cassette bay has got, uh, well, this is a, a clear plastic fascia on the door. And uh, there seems to be dirt trapped between this clear plastic part and the metal frame underneath. And uh, I suppose taking this plastic fascia off would allow me to access that and clean it up. Looking at these screws, these are unusual. I'm not um, familiar with these well, screws or bolts or uh, whatever you want to call them. I'm not really sure what they are. I'm not familiar with them. And uh, I don't believe I have a tool that can deal with those. So let me know if you are familiar with them. I can imagine a specialist tool needed for that. Well, that just... Uh slides off nice and easy there so you can get a better look inside at the mechanism so yeah these are unusual to me i've not seen these before and uh, looking at the back there are some hexagon nuts on there so i suppose i could uh, somehow hold these in place and then just use a regular spanner or a socket to remove those and then get this clear plastic fascia off and clean up the uh, dirt residing in there. Here is a close-up of the mechanism inside with the uh, loading door removed and uh, I'm using my phone handheld, so excuse the movement, but uh, that pinch roller, mm, not sure about that, looks like it might need some attention. Um, but uh, it's been, uh, I suppose, been cleaned up, and um, there you see the SX head, as I mentioned before, and uh, nice big. Uh, electric erase head there as i said it does smell well lubed in there it smells like somebody's really been liberal with the uh, with the grease the uh, that backing plate uh, seen better days but um, that's not an issue it won't affect uh, the performance of the machine of course there is the left view and uh, rather large screws on there that look very easy to remove it's very slightly perished on there i'm not sure whether that's a coating that's peeling very very slightly uh, if you can see that nothing serious but uh, you know again for its age nothing to worry about but uh, very very slightly perished there like there's some sort of coating that might peel off i'm not really sure because it's definitely metal, so I don't know whether it's coated in something. I, I'm, I suppose it's sprayed with uh, some sort of resin or something. There's the right view. Again, two very nice, easy, large screws that uh, mean I should be able to remove the cover quite easily should the need arise. Uh, don't actually feel the need to do that at this stage. I'm reluctant to start tinkering with anything i mean if it isn't broken don't try to fix it and it isn't you know it's working fine so uh, no no need to remove the cover unnecessarily and uh, it doesn't have that uh, issue with what uh, as i said could be some sort of resin coat peeling off on the other edge that i just showed you on the left side this side seems to be perfectly all right so there we are and the rear view, very good condition indeed, nothing to worry about there. The uh, typical RCA input and output and a hardwired power cable, all pretty typical for the era. 
heat dissipation vent holes there and uh, the basic Technics info. I think it's in amazingly good condition. And finally, the underside. Now, I mentioned earlier that uh, the model number on the front, you can see uh, back in the video, is N22G. However, when I did an internet search on it, it came up as this RS M22G. So, interestingly, now I've uh, turned it... Uh, on its back, I can see the underside. I can see that uh, Technics does indeed use this model code RSM22G. Not sure why that RS doesn't appear on the front facia with the model code. Not really sure why. I suspect that's the original sticker that uh, was applied at the factory looking at it. It's uh, pretty old school. So the feet are plastic, by the way and uh, again i don't know whether these are original or not but uh, anyway they are in uh, acceptable condition and nothing to worry about interestingly the rear feet are also plastic but totally different this odd shape here and uh, they've got this hollowed out section in the middle there so I don't know whether there should be something else like some sort of uh, softer material or some sort of plastic insert. I'm not sure, let me know what you think if you know anything about that, if you've seen any feet like this. I think that the feet, certainly the front feet, shouldn't cause any issues. I was slightly worried as to whether the rear feet might just cause a little bit of damage especially if the item is moved about on a shelf i was just slightly worried about that so i've placed it on a mat but uh don't know for sure not sharp certainly no sharp edges on them but uh, anyway there's the underside it's discoloration there on this metal plate on the bottom and uh, apart from that uh, nothing serious whatsoever to report there we are By the way, I had uh, COVID last week. I finally succumbed to the virus after thinking I'd avoided it during the peak of the pandemic. And uh, I was extremely ill and I've somewhat lost my sense of humour. And uh, amongst other things, I, uh, I struggle to do anything. So this is just uh, incidental information, but uh, it's why I couldn't upload a video last week and it's why uh, this one is rather a sombre mood. I'm on the recovery, I'm uh, on the mend, but uh, I have to say I was extremely ill and um, I'm struggling to uh, get back into the swing of things. Anyway, what about the cassette deck? Well, I tried one of those new Maxell UR90s that I've uh, recently been talking about and reviewed and tested. And uh, the very first cassette I put in there, one of those Maxell UR90s, did not spool properly. It came off the uh, spool inside the cassette shell itself. It didn't come out inside the deck. It just didn't spool properly within the shell. That's the tape coming off. And uh, I luckily was watching it very closely because when you buy a new cassette deck, and you test it for the first time, the first thing you should do is watch very carefully, listen for any dodgy sounds, watch how the tape spools. And uh, I noticed it immediately, uh, immediately stopped and ejected it. It avoided a disaster. So uh, I thought, oh, well, I've gone and bought a dud. I've gone and bought, uh, that's why it was cheap and uh, it's under warranty, I'll take it back. But I tried another cassette in, that was a, a UR60, the uh, second one I tried. And uh, then I tried a TDK CD in two. And that also worked absolutely fine, worked perfectly well. It was a 60 minute as well. And I then tried a metal. Now I don't have any type threes. Uh, I've never even had my hands on or seen in person a type three ferrochrome cassette tape but uh, I tried a type 4 metal tape 
and uh, it did start to chew it a bit and uh, it was most upsetting because as you know metal cassette tapes are extremely expensive and uh, one of my well they're all expensive and they're all treasured and uh, it did damage it and uh, very upset about that so uh, that is most frustrating and uh, I tried another one uh, yeah I'm a glutton for punishment I tried another metal cassette tape and it wasn't quite so bad it did spool okay and it didn't really chew it it wasn't perfect though it did leave some wrinkly marks on it needless to say that it isn't perfect the cassette deck and that issue I've had before I've had issues with uh, another cassette deck an old 80s Sony from the ES series that also chews up metal tapes but it's perfectly all right with type ones and type twos don't know why don't have an answer for that if you know why a cassette deck would have issues with type 4 metal cassette tapes uh, but not type 2s or type 1s let me know let me know what you think and what the reason is for that so what's the sound quality like um yeah it, it's all right it's okay it's uh, you know we don't buy these things for audiophile sound quality we buy them for the love and the passion of old audio gear and uh, I have to say that it's a nice mellow analog sound and playing the uh, type 2 cassettes the chrome cassettes I found I had a nice sound I, I was it was a pleasant experience uh, I have no issues whatsoever with it my later somewhat lesser looking cassette decks from Onkyo when uh, when they behave themselves do sound better but there is something about an old 70s brushed aluminium piano key cassette deck there's something about it and uh, you can't beat it it's I mean even if the thing didn't work I think uh, it would just be a beautiful item to display on a shelf uh, and uh, I know that's going to sound odd to some people but uh, Obviously, the fact that it does work, and as I said, I cannot detect any wow and flutter. Now, I'm using my specialist equipment uh, here, my lug holes here, and uh, I'm pretty sensitive to sound, and uh, there was absolutely no wow and flutter. It was really, really smooth in delivery, and uh, very impressed with that. But uh, the statistics, the specifications are basically uh, pretty standard so looking at the audio heritage screenshot here for the specification the playback head is given as sx send dust the erase head is given as double gap send dust ferrite and uh, you can see the frequency responses written there in english but uh, what does the xa refer to does that refer to type 2 or type 3 don't know and uh, the sensitivity uh, 55 decibels and the wow and flutter figure is given as 0.055 uh, percent what i didn't show you was recording i haven't tried recording on it yet i'm trying to keep these videos down because uh, i do get comments from people off uh, youtube these are people that know me personally who say that uh, the videos are a little bit long and a little bit verbose and perhaps I could reduce what I say and reduce the amount of time I spend on uh, issues within the videos and just keep them more succinct so that's what I'm trying to do so I will try recording on it and uh, I think recording on it is for another video so this has been hi-fi lo-fi thanks for watching